Welcome back to CVM Live. It's now time for our major stories in detail. Finance Minister Audishaw has dismissed a declaration from the Jamaica Teachers Association that paying the increased salary to teachers, despite them rejecting it, is effectively union busting. That's not correct. Let's put it that way. It is not unprecedented that you start paying while negotiations continue. That has happened before. In fact, on many occasions, as minister, I've been signing wage agreements when the increases have long gone. So it's not unusual. Minister Shaw was speaking at an IMF briefing today. He defended his administration's record in the matter of granting wage increases to public sector workers, including the previous contract period. This new four-year period that we're talking about now, what is the aggregate? 5% in year one, which we'll be paying, paying now retroactive to April of last year. 2% in year two, 4% in year three, 5% in year four. Add the increments. When you add the increments to that incremental, to that 16%, you add the 10% increments, that's 26 percent in the second four years. The finance minister emphasized that it is important not to delay making the new payment. It is fiscally important that we pay the 5% retroactive to April last year in this budget that ends in March. This payday will see that amount being paid because in terms of our accounting, we cannot take that liability over into this, the next fiscal year. So, if let's leave it at that. The Jamaica Teachers Association is maintaining that government's attempts to push through a wage increase for the nation's teachers without the consent of its rank and file members is tantamount to union busting. JTA President George O'Wall Richards was speaking at a press conference on the subject on Friday. CVM Live's Nika Lewis reports. JTA President Georgia War Richards says members of her association are livid at the treatment meted out to them during negotiations for a new salary package. It is important that we understand that at this point, the teaching force is exhausted, to say the least. The teachers are tired. It has been a journey since 2016 when we submitted our salary claim. And today, one can actually say we are nowhere. The teachers are livid. The teachers are restive. The teachers feel that they have been disrespected. The teachers believe that their real worth is not being quantified or even recognized by government. The proposed 16% increase over four years has been resoundingly rejected by the rank and file members of the JTA. Just on Tuesday of this week, we had an informal meeting with members of government who also informed us that although we have reached no agreement and although within our minds we are still in the negotiation process, at the end of March, the teachers of Jamaica will receive increases on their salaries, increases that they, they suggest would be what teachers are entitled to out of the first year of the agreement. Again, the teachers are saying no. We have no agreement and therefore we will accept no payment. The International Monetary Fund has confirmed that key indicators are in line with improved performance under Jamaica's three-year precautionary standby arrangement. The details were revealed by representatives from the IMF and the government today. CVM Live's Joel Croskill has this report. The outcomes of the 26th of February to March 9 review of Jamaica's performance under the three-year precautionary standby arrangement with the IMF were detailed by Minister of Finance Audley Shaw and Mission Chief Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan at a press briefing Friday. Key macroeconomic indicators continue to reflect 
generally positive trends. Inflation and inflation expectations remain firmly anchored in single digits. International reserves continue to grow. GDP growth, while low, continues to rise. Mr. Shaw also spoke of the projected decrease in the debt-to-GDP ratio over the short term. Debt-to-GDP is projected to be 102% at the end of fiscal year 2017-18. However, the assessment wasn't all positive, with Dr. Ramakrishnan highlighting the outcomes of growth and social interventions. However, growth and social outcomes have been somewhat discouraging. Entrance sub uh, structural obstacles, including crime, bureaucratic processes, insufficient labor force skills, and poor access to finance continue to hinder productivity and growth. Not addressing these bottlenecks could pose risks for continued public support for the government's policy program. Dr. Ramakrishnan also pointed to the need for the government to employ a smaller public workforce as a way of reducing the wage to GDP bill. Creating the space for much needed growth enhancing capital spending and building the social safety net will require going beyond temporary remedies like wage freezes and adjustments to non-wage benefits. It will require high quality measures to overhaul the compensation structure, to retain skills and reward performance, streamline allowances, and prioritize government functions and shed activities that are unaffordable. Joel Crosskill, CVM Live. Effective next Monday, more police officers will be targeting motorists who refuse to abide by the Road Traffic Act. CVM Live's Khadija Thomas has this story. The acting assistant commissioner of police in charge of operations for the Jamaica Constabulary Force, Calvin Allen, confirms that several persons have already been prosecuted. There have been several, several, several tickets have been issued. Uh, persons have been charged, vehicles have been seized. Speaking with CVM Live on Friday, Allen says the JCF has listened to public concerns and will be revising previously implemented measures. That sort of a presence that you saw in the morning, you will continue to see that. And we have also added a feature of ramping up the presence also in the afternoon, which is the PM peak, so that, you know, we got you to work and school on time. We want to also let our presence be there to get you home within a reasonable time. Allen says the police will be strategically placed at critical intersections to ensure security for motorists who have welcomed the measure. The feedback from the motor and public has been overwhelmingly positive and it is part of what has given that sort of uh, energized uh, initiative and presence to continue to ensure that what we are seeing remains and as time goes by we will continue to review to to analyze and to even make it bigger and better khadija thomas cvm live members of the portmore route taxi association are incensed at what they say is a lack of information regarding the delisting of the association from the register of the transport authority cvm lives joel crosskill reports a clear the air meeting hosted by the transport authority and involving members of the portmore route taxi association sought to explain in part the reasons behind the delisting of the taxi association from the books of the transport authority delisting does not mean that you cannot submit an application for your road license it just means you won't be able to do it through that association delisting does not mean that you cannot operate along the routes that you are licensed to operate what delisting is is really to say that the transport authority has discontinued its relationship with the Portmore Route Taxi Association. Corporate communications manager for the Transport Authority, Petra Keen Williams, provided further details as it relates to the delisting. So as it relates to the delisting of the Portmore Route Taxi Association, the Transport Authority received a number of complaints in relation to the operations of the association. An investigation was uh, conducted and a meeting was held with the Taxi Association on February 13 of this year to discuss the breach that we had observed. And subsequently, based on the 
outcome of that meeting, a recommendation, the licensing committee um, approved the delisting of the association. Rashim, one of the Port Maru Taxi Association members, voiced his grouse at how the situation had been handled. The association of the if the president is the problem, say we have a problem with the president, you deal with the president. That's the point what I'm saying. I think I'm poor poor. Me and everything with nobody. We can't talk with me. And that's what me choose. Okay. So if you need this thing now, we like you're automatically forcing me to go somewhere else. Or basically tell me say, scrap the business then. Shortly after Rashim's proclamations, some members of the Taxi Association left the meeting before it ended. Joel Crossgill, CVM Live. Environment Trust Jet is raising concerns about a proposal to declare Riverton and surrounding communities in Kingston an environmental zone of special operation. Jet believes such an action will only be, at best, a short-term fix to a decades-old problem. The proposal came during a meeting at the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, yesterday. It's part of an action plan recommended for Riverton after decades of illegal lighting of fires at the dumping site. Here's CVM Live's Khadija Thomas. After years of grappling with air pollution and health issues arising from the illegal burning of tires at the Riverton dump, the minister with responsibility for land, environment, climate change and investment, Daryl Vaz, made a proposal to tackle the issue. The same emphasis that we have put in dealing with the Zozos, yes, if you want to call this a Zozo, for the environment and the people of Riverton City, well, so may it be. And I am prepared to lead that minister, member of parliament with you from the front. I'm not, I'm not asking anybody to do anything that I'm not prepared to do. The environmental zone of special operations was suggested for Riverton City and the surrounding communities by the minister at the National Environment and Planning Agency. He said the action will be discussed with residents as their support is tantamount to the measure's effectiveness. A short term in terms of dealing with those persons or entities that are creating the problem arresting that and then moving to the next step which is what do we do to sustain and get the air quality back within acceptable range and keeping it that way the minister also called for support from the opposition and the jamaica environmental trust in implementing the measure khadija thomas cvm live and in a CVM update, the police have issued a release saying they are aware of a video being circulated of an altercation with students from a high school in Hanover and a bus conductor. The police say an investigation has been launched and a meeting was scheduled with the management of the institution. The video shows a student menacingly approaching the young man in a white shirt who has now been confirmed as a conductor. The schoolboy has what appears to be a meat cleaver and he subsequently slaps the conductor in the face. The conductor walked toward a Toyota Coastal, which the students hurled missiles at. CVM Live made contact with the Green Island High School and spoke with the school's vice principal yesterday. She told us that they were aware of the incident and it had been reported to the police. The vice principal said they contacted the parents of the students involved and launched their own investigations. Energy Minister Dr. Andrew Wheatley says the discovery of oil seeps on the north coast should not transfer Jamaica's dependence on imports to oil production. CVM Live's Khadija Thomas reports. Speaking at the relaunch of the Jamaica Public Service Foundation Energy Club at Mergrove High School recently, the minister says we have to consider the environmental impact of oil being a fuel source. He says energy is needed to fuel the country's prosperity, as sole dependency on oil to generate electricity has been crippling to our public and manufacturing sector. In fact, we went into a state of recession. Since then, around that time, we developed what we now refer to as our national energy policy. And that national energy policy more or less seeks to give us that level of independence. We got independence, 
1962. But true independence is to be able to have that level of energy security. The minister added that energy security is important as we must be able to provide reliable and affordable energy. He spoke of the government embarking on oil and gas exploration and partnering with Tolo Oil in its search for the resource on the south coast. We set a target of 20% of our electricity coming from renewable sources by 2030. And based on the pace at which we are implementing these renewables, we are far ahead of our target. And as such, we have no up that target to 30 percent of our electricity coming from renewable sources. Khadija Thomas, CVM Live. It's time now for regional and international news with our reporter, Nikoi Wilson. In Antigua, the opposition United Progressive Party UPP leader Harold Lovell is optimistic that his party will win a majority of the 17 seats in the March 21 general election. Mr. Lovell, appearing on state-owned television, did not say how many seats he believes his party would win. He said a mock poll had shown that at best, they would be going to sweep the slate clean. Mr. Lovell, a former finance minister who is leading the UPP for the first time after succeeding former Prime Minister Baldwin Spencer, said the party is extremely happy with where it is right now going into the election later this month. And in St. Lucia, the Speaker of the St. Lucia Parliament, Leon Theodore John, has confirmed that she has resigned her post effective March 1. Mrs. Theodore John's resignation comes after nearly two years in the position. She said she is hoping to take up a diplomatic post in the St. Lucia High Commission located in London. She's expected to assume her new position before the end of March. Mrs. Theodore John was elected speaker in June 2016 following the general elections. And on the international scene. U.S. President Donald Trump has accepted an invitation from North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un for face-to-face -face talks in the coming weeks. With that story, here's Al Jazeera. A South Korean delegation delivered Pyongyang's invitation to President Trump during a visit to the White House. He expressed his eagerness to meet President Trump as soon as possible. President Trump appreciated the briefing and said, he would meet Kim Jong-un by May to achieve permanent denuclearization. North Korea has carried out six nuclear tests under Kim Jong-un since he took power seven years ago. In January of 2016, it announced the successful testing of its first hydrogen bomb. And in November, North Korea announced it had tested a new long-range missile armed with a nuclear warhead mm. capable of reaching the U.S. mainland. The growing nuclear threat caused a global outrage and tough sanctions were imposed against the North. Trump and Kim Jong-un have exchanged a war of words for months. Last summer, Trump warned North Korea against making any threats or it would be met with what he said, fire and fury. That's it for regional and international news on Friday. I am Nicole Wilson. Good evening. Well, those were our major stories. Stick around for news live in five later in the program with Joel Croskill. We continue examining the extent to which dancehall language may be impacting the society and even the police force. We'll be joined by the JCF's Delia Garrick, disc jockey ZJ Sparks, and music promoter Gussie Clark. That's our panel discussion right after this break. Mm -hmm.